while people can use the CERN, uh, while, while people that are CERN users can use the CERN link there, uh, we have enough we have a, a low enough number of people in this session that I think that everyone who wants to follow along can go ahead and just uh, click the everyone else use this binder link. And with that, I'll be quiet and turn things over to Ulrich. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, the uh, what I'll talk about here is a user tool that we call Ganga uh, that has been used uh, within high energy physics for quite many years now. Uh, and in particular, I will highlight some of the use of uh, virtualization that we have included in it uh, quite recently. So I'll give a short introduction here, and then we'll try to run this as a tutorial, uh, getting along, uh, and see how it goes. So uh, first of all, what is Ganga? So many scientific computations, uh, including the ones that we just heard about from Lake, uh, they're too large to take care of by simply running a script from the command line, uh, and waiting for it to execute. We, we are, of course, very well familiar with that in high physics. And over the years, uh, many, many systems have been developed to use this. You, know, you can put up almost an infinite line of different batch grid cloud tools that's been used over the last 50 years to, to deal with this. Uh, getting work done, uh, however, when you have something that's very large and very distributed, uh, means that it gets broken into multiple pieces often. Uh, which, unless you have a system for managing it, then uh, that is both tedious uh, and it's error prone. How do you ensure that all pieces are processed? How do you make sure uh, that uh, you haven't forgotten something uh, along the way? How do you check that it's actually executed all of it? Uh, and that's really what Ganga tries to, to solve. So Ganga is very much following a mantra that says that you can debug and develop your code locally on your laptop, your desktop, and then you can run it globally with as few changes as possible so that you don't have additional bugs and issues coming up from that you forgot to include some shared libraries or configuration file when you change to run uh, anywhere else. Uh, Ganga will also take care of splitting your task up so you can basically define rules for how your task that now is a giant task that needs to run on uh, in 2,000 different instances, how that should be split up from the single one that you have used for your developing. Uh, Ganga will then keep track of which of these pieces fails. It will potentially resubmit them if you're in a system where there is a quite large failure rate, as we often see, for example, in grid environments. Um, it will monitor the progress of everything and then in principle at the end it can also merge all the pieces together if your output now consists not of a single file as an output but again you can define rules that will take all the images created from uh, each of your processing or whatever and merge them into a single image uh, at the end for example so how was it implemented? So Ganga is mainly an interactive framework implemented in Python. So to a large extent, it's something that you sit at the Python prompt uh, and work with. You define your workflow, you submit your workflow, uh, it comes back to you. Uh, for that reason, it's not particularly uh, good to put into a Jupyter notebook. So that's not what I've done for the, uh, for the tutorial here. For the tutorial here, we will just use a terminal from inside Binder instead. Um, but it basically works at the IPython prompt. Uh, and one of the important things uh, is that, of course, means that you don't only have access to the commands and so on that Ganga provides, but you also have uh, access to you know, the full power of, of Python uh, at the same time. Uh, in terms of what we just heard from Nate, then we also have an implementation where we have a well-defined, fully documented API. That one is based on abstract base classes as well. Uh, it shields users from an internal uh, implementation as well. So the objects that the user are interacting with are actually proxy objects uh, that uh, gives a read-only ability when that is what is required. Uh, as again, in Python, this is not something that can be enforced, but it's something where you have to go out of your way in order to, to break the workflow by potentially changing something that is assumed to be read-only at a given point in the uh, in the, your submission and running of your task. So 
central to this API is the job, which defines a given large computational task. So a job then, uh, what you do is that you basically attach different parts to it. So you tell it what you want to execute, we call that the application. You tell it where you want to run it, the back end. So that can be local, just on your machine. It can be on a batch system, it can be on the grid, it can be on a cloud system. Today, we'll just look at a local system. I tried to get grid submission to work from within a binder session, but we unfortunately failed on that. Uh, so that's not something we'll look at today. You define how you divide the task up into pieces, what we call the splitter. You define which external data it should use. So if it's streaming data, uh, we call that input data. We define, you define which ancillary files that are required to be included with your job execution. What do you need to transfer to the remote node for it to run? We define what you want to get back and what is just temporary stuff that can be discarded as part of the processing. You define which environment you run in. So if you want to run on an old simulation on a CentOS 5 machine, you can give it a CentOS 5 image and then it will run within that. And you define finally how you can put the piece together in what we call uh, the merging step. So what will we do in today's tutorial? So we will go through the different parts of the user guide. Uh, essentially, rather than writing something new, I thought I would simply take some pieces out of our user guide uh, as a way of ensuring that this is also something that can be used in the future. Uh, installation will be easy. Today we'll use Binder. So this, this is basically meaning that you have to uh, click on the link and then start a terminal within Binder. We'll look at the basic usage, defining a job and running it. Then we'll look at using some different applications. Uh, we'll look at virtualization and how that's implemented. We'll look at splitters, uh, how to divide up your tasks and potentially post processes at the end uh, if we get the time for it. Uh, so you can find all of it from the link from the agenda page or by going to the user guide and the link that is uh, on this page here if you click off the PDF file. Uh, questions, please put them on Slido uh, as well. Uh, in terms of time that we plan to go through here, uh, we've used 10 minutes now, so this should be okay to basically use the time we have for the different pieces uh, out here uh, on the side uh, to, to walk through the different parts. So I'll keep an eye on Slido uh, on a separate screen to um, see questions coming up there and I'll try to, to, to answer them uh, as we go along. Uh, but I think now that you should simply head over, start up your uh, binder session and get uh, uh, Ganga running. So I can't actually, when I share the screen, I can't see the, if there are comments put into the Zoom session. So uh, DM, if you can read them aloud, if there are any questions there that should be answered that are not coming up in Slido, that would be great. Wait, were you asking me? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. At the moment, I don't think there's any questions in ah, the okay, Zoom good. chat. No worries. So, yeah. But we'll, we'll go ahead and alert you if we see any. Yeah, that's great. So you can see here, I've got a Jupyter session up here now from Binder. I can go ahead here and I can start oh. a new terminal. Ulrich, if it's possible, can you actually also zoom your um, uh, the view on uh, your, your browser to uh, a little bit more than 100, just because uh, sometimes it's a little bit Small on the, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's excellent. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry, it was set small, so I could actually record them as uh, interactive yeah. gifts <laughs> yesterday. Uh, I'll probably even make it one wider here. Yes, start this here. So here you go. So here you can see that I started a Ganga session now. It complained. I had one other one in the window already, actually, in a different window. goes wrong here. Um, so um, so, 
There you go. Here we have the session that's working. So I can then create what's called a job in Ganga like this here. And I can then look at a job. So for example, I can look at what the application is. You can use here tab expansion. This is just an I Python prompt. So this is a very simple job. It's defined as an executable. It will run echo. We'll use the arguments hello world. So absolute nothing fancy here. I can submit this one here. You can do this here. So here, for example, now you can see the read-only ability of it. So if I type now to try to change the application object, then you will see that I get a read-only error from this one here. You will also see now that it reported that the job is completed. So if I now type jobs on this one here, we will see that I have a single job here that's declared as being completed. Uh, we can see that it executed locally, what's called localhost here. This is the IP name of the where it went, but that's not so important here. I can then go ahead and look at the output of it. There's a command that's called peak on the job object. So I can here see the different files that are created. And I can then finally look at the standard output of this one here. And we've got our hello world here. So what else can we do with the job? If we just look at a few things, simple things here. One of the things you will often do is you, during the development cycle, something went wrong, you didn't specify everything correctly. So you can create a new job from an old one. So I can just use a copy command on it. This will create a deep copy of the job. So there'll be no references back to the old one. Remember that one is read only now. And now I can go in and change, for example, the arguments of the job. So I can say here, this one here takes a list of arguments. So I can change this one here. We can put this as few or two words if we like. A little binder, like that. And I can then submit my new job here. I see a question from you, Jim, about the Ganga's vision for production processing, it, or as a chaotic end user or both. It's mainly a chaotic end user thing, uh, because it is running mainly as an interactive thing in that way, that's the main use case we're developing, then that's what we have mainly worked towards, is to have a, uh, to provide end users uh, of a way of getting their work uh, out for mass processing. Uh, there are some places where it has been implemented in server sites, for example, within uh, the data processing for um, Lock Zeppelin LZ uh, in the UK. I'm aware of that they're using it for uh, their Monte Carlo production uh, in the background. Uh, so there it effectively sits uh, on a server and is used for farming out the jobs and so on. Uh, so, so a bit of both, but it's mainly the... Uh, uh, individual use case uh, that is in mind. So maybe one more thing just to look at here is again here we can see here we get the complete overview here of all the jobs again here. If you want to get hold of an individual job, this one here, you can just use a reference to the ID for it. You can do this by name of it and so on as well, if you like. And you can then look at, oh, sorry. Just use an arrow key instead, actually this one here, we get our hello binder here from the new job that we submitted.
So let's maybe try to move on to the next thing in this one here. So if we go to the next one uh, here, one of the things we can see is that we can use different applications in our object. So the most basic one was what we just saw is an executable. Uh, this executable will be copied to wherever worker nail is used for it uh, and run. Um, so that of course has many use cases for that simply, but quite often you want to have something uh, that's more um, complex than that. Um, in the session that's running on Binder, uh, I have uh, started the plugin that we have available uh, as a tutorial, which is just a simple one looking at uh, factorizing uh, numbers, so prior factorization. Uh, it, it's a nice example because it illustrates also the plugin nature of Ganga. You can come along, you don't need to have a specific application written as something that's part of the software and distributed with your software. Your group of people can actually just develop their own plugin for it that's loaded at runtime uh, and which then would fully integrate into all the other uh, API objects uh, that's part of Ganga. Uh, so that's what I've done here with the tutorial package. That one's been loaded in at startup time. Uh, if you look in the uh, uh, in the post build script, uh, uh, then you will see how, how, how this is done uh, for starting up the binder session. Um, and what you can see here is that when I define the job here, uh, I define the job using uh, now an application that's no longer the executable, but using what we call the prime factorizer here. And then I actually also give it a dedicated data set here. Uh, so that's also a specific object that's defined. It's called just a prime table data set. Uh, so there's some code behind that that says, ah, you want the prime table data set. What that will do is it will then go to a server and it basically downloads a list of prime numbers. So applications like this are defined for several experimental collaborations, so, uh, mainly within the LCD collaboration, where this is the standard tool for users to execute their analysis code. Uh, but it also exists, for example, within the T2K collaboration uh, and also in, in quite a few areas outside particle physics. Um, what they can do, these applications, is that when you submit your job, they can take care of comp compilation, configuration, they can potentially check that what you're submitting is actually viable for running, uh, that you're not violating some rules in one way or the other. It can collect shared libraries if they need to be shipped along. So it's basically a way, defining an application object is a way that you can define all the rules that goes into having a successful job of that type running on a remote uh, resource. So if we go back here, we can try now to define this job here. We go up here, go into using different applications. I can take this one here. Oops. Find my job here. So we can now again look at the application object here. So we can see that we have an application object. Now there's this prime factorizer here. It's got the number that we want to factorize. It's got a feature that's called is prepared, uh, which is a way that if the compilation stage, for example, of a defining new job or something that's quite time consuming, then if you copy it, you might not want to recompile it. Uh, but that is prepared as a feature that can then stay as being true for it uh, and therefore you would not have to repeat that stage despite that you're copying the application object. Um, we can now go ahead and submit this one here. Okay, there's a small warning saying that the Python file was not executable. That's fine. It was assumed that you wanted to be that and you'll go ahead and submit this job here. So again, look at the jobs that we've created. Again, no surprise that this is quick done for a relatively low number here. We can go here. This is just a standard output of the file. 
So if we can see here that we have the prime factors, 3 and 509, for this number here, it also tells us quite helpfully that there's a file that's called factors.dat. It's available. Let's try to look in that file. Got it here. And we can see that one has just the numbers in it. This will be more useful if we get to the end of the work uh, of the tutorial where we can see how we can take this, we can split up the factorization of a very large number into a number of separate jobs. Uh, uh, and then we can get here a file that is just easier for using for merging between the output of these different ones uh, afterwards. Can I get a bit of feeling from somebody how well they're keeping up? I think you're going at a good pace. Um, okay, good. Yeah, it's, okay, it's somebody easy. Somebody asked to, you how you, how you would specify command, a command specifically. Yes, so if we try here to look at a specific command here, if I try to take my original job here, that was my original hello world job. So if I want to specify the, ex, uh, the executable as being the, um, uh, application for a new job, I simply do like this here. I can put it into the uh, when I constructed it. So this here, that will then here. What to do here? Ah, sorry. I should of course have made a copy of the job. I make a copy of the job. Now I get a new job. Then I can assign executable to that one. I can then go in for that application. I can now change the actual thing that's executed in it. Uh, sleep, uh, fantastic here. And I can change the, the arguments to be that we want to sleep for 30 seconds, for example. This one here. And I can submit the job. So we can do it like that. That will also allow us actually to see a job that has not finished straight away. So you can see here at the bottom line here, you have a job which now is called in the running state here. So what would happen is that now is a background thread that's running. That one is looking at if that process has finished. The process itself is detached, so I can actually quit Ganga. The job will still keep running. And I can start it off. That's, of course, very important also if you have stuff that's submitted to batch system or to grid systems where, in principle, it could take hours or days before you get your output back. So there's a database behind it that keeps track of all your jobs. It's not lost when you simply just quit your session. So took things slightly out of order here because I wanted to demonstrate also one of the exciting new things in Ganga, which is how we can use virtualization. Um, so if you already have a container defined that has your full environment in terms of software, uh, then you can now use this in Ganga. You do not need to uh, arrive on a plain batch system that your university is providing or you've just got access to and then figure out how on earth do I get to install all the software there. Um, so if there are abilities on that remote system for running virtualization in one way or the other, uh, then Ganga will support that. Uh, so this makes running on remote heterogeneous resources much easier. Um, so, so what could examples be of this? What, what do we need in terms of support uh, on the remote end? Given that most of the jobs that we run in particle physics are not about, you know, we're not starting off servers uh, and so on, so we don't need inbound access to ports and so on. So that means that we actually have a relatively big freedom in what we can use. If Docker is supported on the remote end, uh, then we can support that. You can use as a virtualization, you can use a Docker object here, as you can see in the first one here. If uh, Singularity is supported, we can use that. Uh, and you can, of course, use that with your Docker images as well. We can also run the code inside what's called uDocker, which is an implementation that uh, can run Docker images in an unprivileged way in your user account. And that's actually what we will do here. This runs even on the binder machines. This runs without any problems. So the first example I've created here uh, that you can copy and paste from the... Um, um, 
from the use of the uh, again uh, it's just a trivial one uh, which will give you the weather forecast for any airport in the world feel free to try to change the argument in it just use a three letter airport code and what you should see is that it downloads an image uh, that gives that it then uses that uh, image defines a single command that's called weather um, uh, and then as an argument you give it the airport code here uh, and we'll reserve that the other example below is just if you want to actually convince yourself that you are running in a container uh, and not what you can just take a standard doc image for example the latest of the fedora when the uh, image is here you can cap the release name of that one and see what you get uh, as output So I've got a question about how Ganga could handle cases where submission to a local batch system and the grid system require different and incompatible local environments. Uh, so, so what we have is that we have a system where uh, you can set up code that needs to be executed before your script uh, or executable or whatever application that you're defined needs to run. So you can deal with um, cases, for example, particularly of batch systems tend to be almost worse for this in terms of that they have quite often very differently defined places which directory you start up in if they inherit environment variables from where you submit and so on. So we basically in our configuration file, there's a file sitting in your home directory that's called .gangarc. In that one, you will see that there are um, uh, pre-commands that you will execute. So basically you can put in Python code there that will be executed before your job starts. And it can actually also have a post command things that will be done afterwards. So that's just implemented through a wrapper script. Uh, you can also define these at a wider level. So there's an environment variable that Ganga looks at, uh, which means that this configuration file uh, can be sourced from a central area. So for example, if you have a group of researchers at a lab, uh, on, a, uh, on a local system, you can make sure that they all get the correct configuration of the batch system set up so they can just submit jobs to it uh, straight away like that. How many backends does uh, Ganga provide? Let's look at the plugins here. If we just look at all the plugins, oh, sorry, that's a function. Here that's available. Here we can look at all the backends that are provided. Uh, also, everything that's provided as plugins. So if we look at the backends that are sitting in it as a by default, there's a local one, there's several ones that are related to a direct grid submission. That's probably not used terribly much by anybody anymore. It's D cream ARC. Then there's uh, to the HT Condor uh, batch system. There's a multitude of other batch systems here as well. There's also an interactive one, which basically means you get the standard output straight up on your screen as you're doing it. Uh, the main one that's used for uh, grid systems now is actually a Dirac backend. That one is not loaded up here because it didn't work anyway. Uh, the plugin and it tries to uh, contact a server when it starts, uh, which it can't do from the binder host. So that one is not loaded here. Uh, but that's the main one that's used within Ganga for uh, grid submission. Um, Right at the moment, we don't have a submission to, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, Amazon or other cloud services or whatever. It, it would be fairly trivial to do if there's a, an interested use case for it. It, it would be very easy to, to actually be implemented for it. Uh, so it's fairly easy to do. You look at particularly this tutorial package that we have uh, quite easily outlines what you need to do in order to implement a new version of the, uh, uh, that inherits from the, from the abstract base class for doing it. Uh, if it's new batch system simply, then they can just be done through scripting. These different ones here, LSF, PBS, SGE, Slurm, it's all different configurations of the same code behind it uh, to do that. The other thing, of course, is also, again, this is the IPython prompt, so we should also remember always that we can just ask for help on anything. So if we want to ask for help now on the virtualization on the Docker image, we can just do question mark Docker, uh, and we'll get the code up for this one here uh, to explain it. So 
one of the exciting use cases, I think, of, uh, of using uh, Docker as a virtualization or whatever is also that you can, uh, so for example, if you're using GitLab for your code, you can there build Docker containers that is used for your continuous integration tests. Now from Ganga, you can actually point to those uh, containers. Uh, you can get a token for them, so they can use a token user and token password. These are not publicly available. So that will give you permission to download the container, uh, but not to see any of the other uh, uh, part of your GitLab repo. And uh, that means that you can actually run your code in the identical environment to what um, uh, you used for your continuous integration tests. So make sure that there's not inconsistencies creeping in there, that you actually run your code in a different way because now you run it on the, the batch system, whatever, where some configuration, some shared library is different uh, or whatever. But you can actually make sure that you have an identical use case there. So let's try maybe just simply to run the um, uh, the sorry going the wrong way here. Uh, run the virtualization here. Let's try maybe just the first one here. Find my job here. Let's say I might want to say that I want to look at the weather in a place that might be more sunny today than here. And I can submit my code. Cannot submit job. That is, oh, sorry, I called it a new name. So I can submit the job here. Again, we have the IPython prompt, so we can go actually look at what's happening on the machine. So what you can see here now is that it will actually go, the curl command you have running here is actually the one that's downloading the, uh, uh, the image from Docker. So we can see that, so I said, this is using the new Docker technology here. So this here, so everything runs in user space. Uh, there's nothing required from the system level. It does mean that there are limitations on what you can do in those containers. You can go to the new Docker. Uh, website uh, or um, GitHub repo uh, and read about those. You can see it goes on now, it untars the image here. Uh, the Python 2 will come from within new Docker that's still written in Python 2. Python uh, Ganga itself is all written in uh, Python 3 now. Um, and now we can actually see the pwt command here was actually the um, um, image starting of itself, it's completed now here. We'll come out here and we got the weather forecast for Copenhagen Airport here. So if we maybe go on to the last bit here of looking at splitters and post processors. So splitters, as I said, basically define how your job can be broken up in pieces for individual execution. So if this is about analyzing large amounts of data, this will typically mean you have a very large data set defined in some way or the other. This could maybe just be a single text file with lines of names in it, whatever. The splitter will then take that data set and will cut it into pieces and then assign them to each of what we call a sub job. Um, it could also be, for example, if you're doing large scale simulation, it could be that you keep running the same job again and again, but you just need to give a random number seed to each of them. Then instead of just having a loop that submits many, many jobs, it might be much nicer to have a splitter so you can define a single job, you can define a rule about how your random number seed should be updated for each of them. It might just be an argument to the, um, uh, to the uh, application. Uh, and then you can submit it as a single job. It will also, in the overview, when you type jobs, it will not just pollute everything with potentially having thousands of jobs written there. 
The post process then at the other end of that, they define what actions should be taken when the monitoring discovers that a job is done. A job is done when all its sub jobs are done. So that could, for example, be merging the output, the sub jobs created by the splitter. It could also send you a notification uh, if you like. It could maybe even run another short job on the output from it. It could do some additional error checking, for example. So the Ganga itself would recognize if your job has failed. That's simply just based on the exit code uh, uh, of the application you're running. But you might have some more uh, advanced error checking you can do at that point. If the job has failed, then you can decide on an action to do uh, based on that, for example. Again, you can see what I defined. Again, if we go back to the plugins, you can see what defined ones are defined here. So we can see, for example, the splitters here. We have one we call arc splitter. That one basically just makes sure that if, for example, you have an executable, it will run that executable multiple times over with different arguments. Uh, we have a generic splitter that actually allows you to change any kind of attribute of the job for each of them. Uh, we also have the prime factorizer splitter. That's the one that we will try to use here in the short example here. If we go and look at the post processors, we must have them somewhere else in the list here. Here you go, there's a number of post processors uh, defined here that allows you to do different actions. There's also one that's called the custom merger. That one actually just takes a Python script. So inside that Python script, you can do whatever you like in terms of post processing without that you necessarily have to go and develop a new uh, object for the API in Ganga, so it's a bit more directly accessible for a user. So if we try maybe here to define a go to the splitters here. We can try to define our job here. So we define a new job here, as we can say here, what I do now is we have the same prime factorized application as I had before. I've now given it a more ambitious integer number to do the prime factorization of. I'll give it the input data again. Uh, that input data takes some attributes. If we look in documentation, we'll see that basically defines how many million prime numbers I need to download. Each of the files contains a million prime numbers. So this one here will take up to 30 million prime numbers in. And then I define my splitter, where I basically say I want to split up the task of factorizing this large number here into 10 pieces. So we can define the job here, and we can submit it. So now we go, it will go away, it submitted all the jobs here. If we go and look at jobs here, you'll now see it says it's running. You'll see here we have 10 sub jobs here. Provides a little encoding over here at the end that basically tells how many jobs are running, fire finished, failed, uh, etc. That can be good to look at if you have something that divides up potentially into thousands of jobs. I can also look at the individual sub jobs like this here. So that gives me a slice that's equivalent to the one I get for all the jobs, but now I only get it for the sub jobs here in this one here. All these here, I remind you again, are running on just a local system. So if we go and look here, top here again, we'll see we have them all running here, just on the same local system here. Um, what takes the time here is not actually the prime factorization, uh, it's just downloading the files with the prime numbers that takes, uh, that, that takes time uh, in these jobs here. It looks like they're finished now. If I do j.subjobs again, we'll see that all the subjobs are completed. If I type jobs, you'll see that the master job, as we call it here, is also completed now. So if I now want to look at the standard output of all these sub jobs here, well, I could just use Python on this again here. So from JS in J dot sub jobs, I want to peek on the file factors dot that that each of them provided. Let's see here, I didn't find the file. How interesting! I probably did something slightly wrong. Let's just do the standard output instead. Ah. Which so of course the sub job object has to do it on. There we go. 
There we go. So this here is simply just the output of all the jobs I see here. So we see I get some prime factors up here, and this one up here, and I then get some prime factors in not any of these here. I get one in this one down here. I see I also get a warning from these here that says that not all the prime factors have been found. That's of course because each sub job has not necessarily found all of them. So in a merger, what you could imagine to do this contrived example here, you could imagine that you pick the prime factors that have been found by each of the sub jobs, and then multiply them together to check that everything had in fact been found. So let me just see. So here you go, here you can see all the factors here, feel free. The convention here is just that it has the prime factor two, three times here, prime factor three once, et cetera, uh, is the encoding that we have here uh, in this one here. So if we go and look at the example of how we could, for example, define a post processor for this here, then we can simply just attach a post processor to the job. We can run a post processor on its own as well. So if you have a job that has already executed, you can just say that I want to run a post processor on it. Now, in general, for generic bookkeeping about what you have done in all aspects of running, uh, it is better if you define it up front, then you can go back and look at what you've actually done. So that's one of the other very important parts of uh, uh, of Ganga is that you can actually go back and look at how did I actually run this, which arguments did I actually run it with, which random number seed did I run it with, and so on. Something that often also in a user-based environment often is lost is this reproducibility. You can also take the Ganga object and you can simply export it into a text file that you can store together with your workflow or whatever to be able to document later uh, what was actually done. So you can see in the job I did here now, I just defined what was called a text merger here. What that one will do is it will simply concatenate the text file. So it's a very simple one here. As I said, we could imagine putting in a checker that would actually go through, find the numbers, and see that they actually added up to our original number here that we indeed had, uh, sorry, multiplied up, that we indeed had found all the prime factors enrolled. Somebody here tried to just look at here, so just, just look at our question here, how to kill if you have a gang consistency frozen. In principle, you should be able just to do control C uh, to do it. Otherwise, you can indeed stop the Ganga session, just running the Python session running, just start it again. It should read up the repository uh, again. So Ulrich, uh, we're getting near time and we still yeah. have, we have a few questions. So are yes, you that's brilliant. getting- Let's go ahead, okay. let's go ahead with the questions. We can stop here. That's basically the end of what I wanted to go through. Okay, fantastic. Um, right, so maybe I can once again uh, just put the uh, in the Zoom chat. I will post the I will post the view for the the questions on Slido, and then uh, yeah. you can share and we can go through them again. Yeah. I guess we already answered Jim's. Yeah, I think I've answered quite a few of them already, yeah. actually, but I'm happy to go into more detail. Uh, let's see. Here we go. So where's Ganga mostly used? Ganga is by far the most used within the LSCB collaboration. So um, uh, within the LSCB collaboration, this is the standard way that users are analyzing their data. Uh, any access to the grid for a user within a CB can only be done through Ganga. That's the only access point they have. Yeah. Um, there we see it done mainly for data analysis, but also quite a lot for just running Troy Monte Carlos and so on, uh, for example. Um, the usage is not always efficient, as with um, seen with uh, uh, user initiated code. So we do see a quite large fraction of failed jobs. Uh, typically coming from that, despite that it's quite easy in Ganga to test things locally and then submit them remotely, there's always this, you know, oh, I just need to fix this last thing. I fix it, I submit it uh, remotely.
you're not doing. One of the things we do to guard against that is also that the monitoring in Gambia will actually, if a job is failing, it will in general try on the grid to resubmit the job one more time. But if it sees that, sees repeated jobs failing, it will actually cut that process short and stop the whole processing of the older sub jobs in order to avoid wasting resources where um, uh, uh, they are overused. So the next one here, I think I answered uh, the next two questions here uh, already. So yeah. you can change the executable, you can change the executable. Uh, you have the configuration system, the .gangrc file that can allow that. Um, the next one here about how um, uh, Ganga seems quite mature and robust. Uh, the software is quite old actually. The software comes back to 2004, I think. The very first oh, okay. part of this was developed in Python 1.4, uh, if any of you can remember <laughs> the existence of that. Um, there has been a lot of refactorizations done uh, 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 and they're still going on. One of the things we're doing at the moment is that we are refactoring the database back end of it. The jobs now are persisted through simply XML files that are written out. Uh, that has proven to work quite well, um, but we see now people that have tens of thousands of jobs in Ganga, uh, and then it's not really scaling anymore. We're moving to move this to a proper database backend uh, for it. That will also allow us in principle then to put that database somewhere else. At the moment, all information about users' jobs are stored locally in their home directory. In principle, when we have a database support, we could put it somewhere else if you would like to. Uh, in terms of the team, the team is small now. We don't have any dedicated funding for Ganga anymore. So the team is effectively uh, two people at Imperial College uh, and me at Monash um, in Australia. We have then been incredibly successful in terms of getting uh, effort from Google Summer of Coding. We have two students this year as well, uh, and they have actually really proven to be a fantastic way of getting some of the more software engineering parts uh, of Ganga done. Uh, to it. So this year, one of them is working on uh, the database backend, uh, and the other one is working on uh, getting a, um, a um, web interface to it. So working in the same way as JupyterLab or whatever. You start up Ganga, it gives you a link to a local host uh, port number, and then you'll be able to interact through the browser with Ganga as well, something that will be easier to do afterwards. Ben is asking about if you can define a DAG of some kind. Uh, we do have something like that in Ganga. So by default, the jobs are just splitting up into one level. We do have something that we call tasks in Ganga, which allow you to define rules that will create new jobs from a previous layer, can merge them together and so on. Um, we're not particularly happy with it at the moment. Uh, it's working. Uh, 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 at the moment, but it doesn't somehow the, the API of it doesn't feel very Ganga like uh, uh, in the way that it was developed by somebody else uh, and put in. Uh, so it is one of the things that we would actually like to, to go through and really start out doing it in a proper way where we start talking about the interface we need for it and then we go away encoding it rather than that we were presented with something that was already done. Uh, so that is an area that's under development, I would say. We can do it at the moment with a more complicated workflow, but it is cumbersome. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for the really, really nice 